Well, good afternoon. I'm excited to be able to share with you. I see that you can't hear me. Is there somebody who can help this to turn on? Or should I just use this one? Oh, turn it on. Okay. There we go. The voila. <laughs> it's amazing techno how technology works, right? So I'm very delighted to be with you all this afternoon. And I know you have been inundated with a lot of information so far. And as I looked over the topics that were going to already be addressed, I realized that spirituality is a topic that pretty much has been addressed. And so I was trying to discern from the Lord, hear from him, what, what would you have me teach in my afternoon session that might be helpful to the body who comes um, here, to the Brethren World Assembly? And I thought about um, what I'm doing presently at Grace College and Seminary is teaching in the area of spiritual formation. So I won't necessarily be looking at the historical foundations, although there are some um, historical quotes and things like that in here. But I'll be kind of taking us to the present and helping us to see what are some things that we can do to cooperate with God's work. He's already in the process of spiritually forming us. That's his vision for our lives. So what can we do to participate in that? And so that's kind of the focus of what I'll be addressing today. And I realize, just as, as another presenter said, some of you are well versed in these things and could probably be up here and um, share a lot more than even I can. And then others of you are probably still trying to figure out why do we call it spiritual formation? Why don't we just call it Christian growth and you know maturity or discipleship? So I realize we have probably a very broad gamut here in the room. So I hope that uh, I challenge those of you who are you know further along in the journey and also um, give those of you who are just kind of uh, beginning on um, in this area and trying to grasp the vocabulary of it all. Um, some, some tools to be able to maybe bring back into your own world and um, reflect on these things that we've been talking about this weekend. Well, um, I think that spirituality has been a very hot topic lately. Spirituality in general, but also Christian spirituality. And that is, that is what I will be um, focusing in on, is Christian spirituality. And I hearken back to Augustine who said, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. He had a basic understanding of the soul that yearned for God. And um, he understood that the, the, the human being is hardwired for delight. And if you've read his confessions, you realize he found delight in a lot of things that were not godly. But as he journeyed towards Christ, um, he realized that God was really his full delight. And so as we think about spiritual formation, we realize that we are hardwired for delight, but our delight is not hardwired to God. And so that's the journey of spiritual formation, is to um, help our delights to be acclimated towards the things of God so that we find pleasure in him as our ultimate source of delight. And then that will prioritize and appropriate the other pleasures and the other delights that we find in this world that we actually can enjoy and are part of God's um, will for us. Um, so let's start by defining spiritual formation. And if I was in the classroom, I, I like to be an interactive teacher, so forgive me if I can't um, necessarily draw you out in that way, but I'd like you to think about your own understanding of spiritual formation. What is spiritual formation. You can even look at the words that are right there. Spiritual formation. So spiritual has to do with the immaterial part of our lives. And it's the connection that we have with God. And the idea of formation is this idea, it's an ongoing process. So it's not this just kind of static thing that happened to us. It's constantly being formed. So the spirit is forming our spirit to look like Jesus himself. So let me give you a few definitions that are out there 
in the world, not necessarily brethren, but um, are things that I think we can be informed by in our brethren circles. And so um, I would be remiss if I didn't bring you Dallas Willard because he is um, one of the uh, keynote speakers in this um, realm. So he says that spiritual formation is the spirit-driven process of forming the inner world of the human self in such a way that it becomes like the inner being of Christ himself. So that's the goal of spiritual formation, is to that have the inner being to be like Christ. And so the emphasis is not so much on getting the behavior right, it's on getting the heart acclimated to the things of God so that the behavior is just kind of a natural outflow of being Christ-like. So we think like Christ thought. We have the emotional system and the emotional maturity of Christ. All of those things are part of what spiritual formation really needs to entail. Um, I was educated at uh, Talbot School of Theology and Dr. Sosi was one of our professors. And um, he said that um, spiritual formation is growth toward a destiny characterized by the fullness of Christ's life and character. Again, another emphasis on Christ's life and character to be, to be molded into that. And as we talked about that last night, I thought, how neat that, um, that, that kind of Christ's life is such a big part of what we understand as spiritual formation. We've carried that tradition out. Well, I did my um, doctoral dissertation on the role of attachment patterns and um, spiritual formation. And so I was really looking at um, how the human bonds with other people and whether or not there's any correlation with how we bond with God, because it is a relationship. And I think that a lot of my growing up years um, the emphasis has been on understanding correct doctrine about God. And if relationship happens to, you know, get in there, that's fine. But um, as I matured, I realized this is about intimacy with God. And so the information that I'm finding about God and his word um, should impact how I live my life. And that's what I think of as spiritual formation. And so for my um, dissertation work, I needed to, you have to define everything, you know, when you're in the academic world. So um, I came up with a, a definition of spiritual formation that was um, relationality was the emphasis. And so um, here is my definition. Uh, spiritual formation um, is, let me just read it off the screen because I can't find it in my notes, um, is the ever deepening relationship between God and his beloved that leads to Christ's likeness. And so I think the emphasis on relationship is important to us. And I think that that really does reflect the brethren tradition to recognize that it's not just about getting correct doctrine or information about God, it's about relating to God. And yes, we do need accurate information about him. That is very important, but that's the first step that should lead to relationship. And so intimacy with God is a big part of what I understand as spiritual formation. And um, some of us are probably a little bit more comfortable with the idea of emotional intimacy and others of us are a little bit like, mm, let's keep that away. Um, but I want to um, have us think about some dimensions of emotional intimacy that are just kind of commonplace in our own lives, and then think about that in terms of our relationship with God. So I found this kind of uh, humorous thing that's on the internet, and um, it's 10 rules to avoid intimacy. So it's kind of a fun way to look at intimacy, and this was written by somebody who is just, you know, kind of in the um, interpersonal world, but I think it's kind of telling when you ask the questions about your relationship with God. And so here is the first rule to avoid intimacy. Don't talk. This is the basic rule for avoiding intimacy. If you follow this one rule, you will never have to be intimate again. If you are forced to talk, don't talk about anything meaningful. Talk about the latest episode of CSI, your newest household upgrade, or the weather anything but your feelings. And I think about what Dr. Pugh brought to us last night, prayer. 
prayer is talking with God, listening and talking. And so this number one rule, you could insert the word don't pray. That's how to avoid intimacy with God. And as we go through these, they're kind of funny to think about, but I also want you to think about your own life. Which ones do you tend to do in your own life? And so maybe God can use this as a way to open up some of the barriers that we place in relationship with him. Number two, never show your feelings. Showing your feelings is almost as bad as talking because your feelings are a way of communicating. If you cry or show anger, sadness, or joy, you are giving yourself away. You might as well talk. And if you talk, you could become intimate. The best thing to do is remain expressionless, although this is still a form of communication. It only says that you don't want to be intimate. Number three, always be pleasant. Always smile, always be friendly, especially if something is bothering you. You'll be surprised how effective that hiding your feelings from others is in preventing intimacy. It may even fool them into thinking that everything is okay in your relationship. Then you don't have to change anything or become emotionally close to another person. When I did my dissertation, I was looking at um, one of the variables was disappointment with God. And there were, uh, I think I had about 420 surveys that I did, and about, I think about 70 of them, people could not answer the question. Um, it had something to the effect of, when I become angry with God, I still want to have relationship with him. There were people that I think never became angry with God because maybe in their expressions of faith that was inappropriate to do. And so I wonder what that does in our intimacy with God if I'm not able to express disappointment or anger. Now, we realize I'm the one who's wrong if I'm angry with God, but that wrestling that needs to take place for us to be real, if that gets shut down prematurely, then I wonder how authentic we can be, um, not only with God in a vertical sort of way, but with our fellow brothers and sisters in a, uh, in a horizontal way, um, if, if that's not appropriate. Okay, number four, always win, never compromise. Never admit that another's point of view may be as good as yours. If you compromise, that is an admission that you care about another person's feelings, which could lead to intimacy. Number five, is this the great American issue right now? <laughs> Always keep busy. If you keep busy with your work, you don't have to be intimate. Others will never figure out that you are using your work to avoid intimacy. Because our culture values hard work, they will feel unjustified in complaining. Likewise, devoting yourself to work will give others the feeling that they are not as important as your work. In this way, you can make others feel unimportant in your life without even talking. Isn't that amazing? And I wonder how much we try to do work for the Lord without inviting him into the process and talking to him along the way. We are busy for the Lord, um, but sometimes our relationship with him becomes very shallow because of that. All right, number six, always be right. There's nothing worse than being wrong because that is an indication that you are only human. If you admit that you are wrong, you might as well admit that others are right and that will make them look as good as you. If they are as good as you, then you may have to consider the other person. Before you know it, you will start to feel connected to another person. I think maybe um, that has been an issue for us as we've had many um, sorts of disagreements over the years. We think that we're the only, we kind of have a monopoly on the truth. Number seven, never argue. If you argue, you may discover that you and the other person are different. If you are different, you might have to talk about the differences to make adjustments. If you begin making adjustments, you may tell the other person who you really are and what you really feel. These revelations might lead to intimacy. So if you're trying to avoid that, never argue. Number six, this is a great one um, for those of us who like to be indirect. 
Make others guess what you want. Ever heard about an invisible hoop? And you keep moving that invisible hoop and people keep trying to jump through it, but you keep moving it and they have no idea where it is. So make others guess what you want. Never tell others what you want. That way when others try to guess and are wrong, as they often will be, you can tell them that they don't really understand or love you. If they did love you, they would know what you want without you telling them. Not only will this prevent intimacy, but it will drive others crazy as well. And I think about even our prayer life. Sometimes we don't articulate some of our deepest desires to the Lord. And so um, I don't think it drives him crazy, but I think it does block our intimacy with him when we don't really get in touch with the deepest desires. We say, bless, bless this meeting, Lord, or bless this in my life, and we don't really get at what that blessing would look like. What's, what's my vision and what's his vision? And, and maybe if those two things are different, can he align my heart to his heart? So number nine, we would never do this. Always look out for number one. Remember, you are number one. All relationships exist to fulfill your needs, not anyone else's needs. Whatever you feel like doing is okay. You're okay. The other person is not okay. If others can't satisfy your needs, they only care about themselves. After all, you are the one making the sacrifices in the relationship. Now, you might not think of this in terms of relationship with God, but I think a lot of people come to Christianity to a saving knowledge um, in their relationship with Jesus with kind of a consumer mentality. And they kind of see, does God work? And that has this number nine rule. Always look out for number one. And then if God doesn't work for them, then they kind of seek other things. Instead of surrender and um, seeing if maybe God being number one um, puts us in our proper place and that can actually be where abundant life is found. Okay, number 10. We all love technology. Be available to it at all times. Keep the TV, internet, and cell phone turned on at all times, during dinner, while you're reading, while you're talking, especially when you're talking about something important. This rule may seem petty when compared with the others, but it is good preventative action. Staying distracted by technological interruptions keeps you and the other person from talking to each other. Which leads us back to the number one rule, don't talk. It's amazing to me how much technology and noise and visual media stimulation has just inundated our lives. And so I think we need to be particularly vigilant with this one and make time for us to um, be able to be silent before the Lord. And, and maybe we have his scripture, which isn't Sesame Street. It doesn't jump out and dance at us, but it's a place for us to um, be quiet before him and let him speak to us. So before I go on, um, you have the list there if you got um, a handout. I want you to think about this for your own life. Is there one of those 10 rules that you uh, particularly resonated with? One that you thought, hmm, I wonder if that distracts me a bit in my relationship with God. One that um, resonated with you to say, I wonder if that's a way that I'm avoiding intimacy with God. Maybe not, you haven't done it intentionally, but um, maybe it has been part of um, some issues that you've experienced. So I'll give you just a, a minute to maybe star it, and um, then you can go back to it after you, know, you leave the assembly and you have time to really think about stuff. Um, so which one of those 10 is um, one that resonated with you? And I think there are some more, so if you need one, feel free to raise your hand. Back there. Do you have any more? There's one more. Only one? Yeah. <laughs> Let's just start with one. I, I like to do baby steps. Otherwise, it gets a little overwhelming. I mean, I, probably all of them we would, could um, resonate with to a certain degree.
And again, you, you may feel a, a little uncomfortable connecting these two things of relational intimacy with relational intimacy with the Lord. But um, again, that was what I did for my doctoral dissertation. And I did find, uh, along with another um, professor that I, I was a TA for, her doctoral dissertation as well, looked at attachment patterns and spiritual formation. And um, there is a statistical correlation between those two variables that is very interesting. So you can't say, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg, but you can say that those two uh, ideas are correlated. And I think what that tells us is that we kind of have an operating system, a relational operating system. And if we see Christianity as a relational dynamic, not just um, a, a propositional truth uh, sort of thing, then how we relate on the horizontal level um, impacts or is connected to how we relate on the um, vertical level. And then vice versa, how we relate to God, how we're loved by Him, how we rest in Him can actually change the dynamic of how we move towards others in relationship. So um, I'm going to keep moving, but um, hopefully you have your list there and you can keep thinking about that um, for future reference. Now, um, I realize that John Calvin's not the most popular person in the Brethren circles because um, he was not very nice to the Anabaptists. And, um, but, but I think that we can still learn from him. And so if you want to boo hiss, feel free to collectively do that now towards Calvin. But um, he was a great systematizer of biblical knowledge. And I think he brought a lot to the Reformation and the Protestant movement because of that. And um, the Protestant reformers emphasized the idea of double knowledge when it came to growing in spirituality. And so the beginning of his institutes, which is this multi-volume, very heavy, doctrinally, you know, oriented sort of book. It's not touchy-feely. This is not like Dr. Phil sort of stuff. Um, this is how he opens the Institutes. And he says, there is no deep knowing of God without a deep knowing of self, and no deep knowing of self without a deep knowing of God. Now you may say, that sounds a little circular. What, what are you getting at? What is he getting at? Well, what he means by this is that growing Christians need to have this two-pronged approach to their spiritual formation. Knowledge of God without knowledge of self, think about accumulating biblical knowledge, what does that promote in us? If I really don't see who I am and what my struggles are, what sort of trajectory can that take me on? Any ideas? Just a lot of head knowledge about God. What, what are some of the dangers of that? Feel free to shout it out and I'll put it in the microphone. Lots of head knowledge, very little knowledge of my neediness for God. Pride, Pride yes, because I kind of see this formulaic approach to uh, my spirituality. It's just an accumulation of knowledge. And if you have a good retention memory, you can be pretty prideful, yeah. So the kind of a pharisaical sort of religiosity, self-righteousness that is steeped in um, this knowledge and not experiential knowledge. Okay, well, if we go on the opposite end of the spectrum and we just all have knowledge of self, which seems to be what our culture really um, seems to celebrate. Get in touch with your feelings, you know, navel gaze, introspection, how do you really feel, all that sort of stuff. What did your parents do to you when you were growing up that makes you the way you are? All that kind of self-evaluation. What happens if that's all I have, but I have no knowledge of God? Self-justification. Okay, self-justification. I'm fine. I'm, I'm the victim, so because of that I can do whatever I want. Yeah, so there's no accountability in terms of um, there's, there's some bigger things at stake here than my personal comfort and um, healing from pain. Any other ideas? Potential despair like within a 
Yes. Non meaning existentialism. Yes, so potential of despair because life is meaningless. Because if I, I don't have it in me to make this world meaningful. And um, I think our culture has bought into that, and we just kind of implode because um, my little world revolves just around me, and it's not enough. We were made for something, for someone bigger than ourselves. And um, so we're experimenting with that in our, in our culture around us, our secular culture, and, um, and, and we were made for God, and our hearts are restless till we find our rest in Him. And so if we have knowledge of self without knowledge of God, it becomes morbid introspection and kind of a form of narcissism. It's all about me. And then even Christianity can be all about me. And so when you think about getting on a plane, I always ask my students, well, which wing would you want, the, the right one or the left one? Oh, you kind of want both, right? <laughs> that's what makes the plane stay up in the air. When we think about double knowledge, that's what we need to think about. I need both. I need knowledge of God and knowledge of self. Some of you may have seen a chart like this before. I know that some um, Christian organizations have um, put this out. But I think it is a very helpful graphic for us to see the importance of both knowledge of God and knowledge of self. As, as knowledge of, I tend to enter into it as knowledge of self um, because I came from a very um, highly doctrine oriented sort of thing. So I have a lot of information about God already just by growing up in the church. And so as I get in touch with who I really am, what my struggles are, my weaknesses, my neediness. I bump up against my neediness all throughout the day. I don't know about you, but that, that's my world that I live in. I, I'm, I'm not adequate to take care of myself in this world. That's life after the fall that we all live in. And so as I get in touch with that throughout the day, I can appropriate truth about God into that experience of myself. Now, a lot of us just kind of go through the day mindlessly. I get my tasks done, I do what I'm supposed to do, and I'm not very mindful of what's going on beneath the surface. And so my studies in spiritual formation have encouraged me to start to look at what's going on beneath the waterline of my life, beneath the behaviors and kind of the, the conscious um, thought process to actually what's, what are the beliefs, what are the deep beliefs that are driving some of the emotions and um, the behaviors that are in my life that especially we get vexed by that are ungodly. And so instead of trying to change it up there on the top, don't speak angrily at somebody. How do I deal with the anger that's still there? Even though I might not speak it out, but I'm still angry or I'm still resentful. Or maybe I'm jealous. Nobody gets to see that. That's not a behavior. So there's something going on beneath the surface of our lives that really needs the truth and the power of the gospel. And that's what this is all about. The good news is that you are worse off than you ever really dared to articulate. Yet, you are more loved than you ever dared believe because Jesus lived and died in your place. And so, as a growing Christian, I need to appropriate that truth of the gospel in my life every day. And so that is part of um, growing in these two trajectories, knowledge of God and knowledge of self. Now, if um, your tradition tends to focus more on knowledge of self, what's going on beneath the surface, and not as much on biblical truth, then I would encourage you to um, try to balance that out. Um, but what I find is that where transformation happens is the intersection of um, truth and life. And so when I'm in connecting to what's going on in my life, wow, I really don't know how to handle this Lord. All of a sudden, his wisdom is such an important doctrine to me. His omniscience is an important doctrine. It's not just head knowledge anymore. Or the fact that, wow, I find myself, I'm, I'm kind of living in a state of worry or low dread kind of thinking about the future and wondering how it's all going to work out. Okay, so I could, have, I could tell myself, 
don't worry about anything, do, you know, do not be anxious about anything, but by, every, you know, by prayer and petition, and I could recite that verse to myself, but then I have to think, wow, God is omnipresent, he's omniscient, and he's omnipotent. That is knowledge of God that now gets subjectively experienced in my reality, and that should change my worry patterns. That should help free me up from the anxiety that would otherwise derail my life. So I think that's the practicality of knowledge of self and knowledge of God. Um, in order to equip us a little bit more in this double knowledge, I um, found that Larry Crabb's basic principles of Christian growth are helpful. And Larry Crabb was a professor at Grace uh, College, well, Grace Seminary in the um, 80s and has gone on to be one of the leading voices in um, Christian evangelical spiritual formation circles. I think um, his emphasis on a spirituality that comes from the inside out has been very helpful for our circles because he has brought back to us um, maybe some of the original things that our founders um, really emphasized and that's uh, the idea of a relationship is um, an important part, not just biblical knowledge um, but that biblical knowledge needs to be appropriated into our lives. So um, he approached spirituality as a cooperative relationship with God who has a vision for us to be intimately united with him. So um, here's the first, I'm going to skip through this. Um, here's the first basic principle that um, he shares. God always reaches us where we are, never where we pretend to be. Now, when I heard him say that, there was almost like a collective hush in the room because I think um, one of the sad things about uh, Christian circles is that we do tend to put on a mask. We, we know what the biblical mandate is. We also know we don't live up to it. And so we pretend to be something that we're not. And unfortunately, we bring this pretense even into our prayer life and our relationship with God. And so um, the truth that Romans tells us that there is therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus is an important reality to help free me up to no longer feel like I need to pretend in the presence of God. And as I become more um, accustomed to not pretending with God, maybe that can free me up to um, take off the mask with a few um, safe others who will um, still love me even in the midst of realizing that I'm not as perfect as I um, look to be. So the need for knowledge of self or self-awareness is embedded in this first principle. So self-awareness is a spiritual formation practice. And again, for me, that was almost like heretical. Really? I need to see what's going on beneath the surface. I need to spend time at that level in my devotions. So maybe it's not so much I need to spend more time in my devotions, but maybe I need to have some different emphases in my quiet time with the Lord and allow him to bring to the surface the things that are going on beneath the surface. So I can actually be authentic with him in my um, time with him. I think the reason that um, we don't automatically have a sense of self-awareness is, is basically the fall, and um, we don't know what to do with our bad, and um, we don't often realize as Christians that we still need a savior. And so we think that Jesus dying on the cross was kind of back then for justification, and we don't realize that I still need Jesus to cover me, his righteousness to take care of me. And so um, there's lots of barriers to self-awareness. Um, I think there's some, you know, kind of surface things, too, that pop up. Um, a couple things that come to mind is that we don't value self-awareness. That doesn't always, that wasn't something I learned about in youth group. Nobody pays me to do this. It's not part of a job description in ministry. And so self-awareness is kind of like, well, if you want to do that on the side, that's fine. But really, the task is this. But if we are not 
growing in self-awareness or self-knowledge, then we um, can tend to have a very superficial uh, sort of ministry. Busyness as well keeps us from self-awareness because I don't have time. And I'm not necessarily saying we add one more thing to our list of already you know, packed schedules, but maybe in the midst of some of our mindless activities, uh, maybe as I'm driving the car somewhere, or maybe as I'm washing the dishes, or um, doing something with my hands that isn't so mindful, uh, maybe there's an opportunity for me to reflect on what's been going on beneath the surface. Um, where have I been lately? What have I been meditating on? What have been kind of the feelings that have been compelling my activity? You know, the Bible says that the lo- uh, Paul says, the love of Christ compels me. And I think, wow, I, if, if that was the standard for all the stuff that got done in the church, I'm not sure if we'd get as much done <laughs> Because it's not always the love of Christ that compels me. Fear of failure compels me a lot. Fear of um, people thinking that I don't have it all together compels me a lot. Um, Wanting to make an impression compels me a lot. So those are the sorts of things I need to start to get in touch with. And then I can repent of them. And now I can ask the Lord to replace those misguided motives to um, replace them with the motive of love, which I think is very important. So um, false pretense is a big part of what keeps us from growing spiritually. Other barriers. Um, You know what, is it okay if I just take this off so I can see my PowerPoint? Um, We've never been confronted with the need to understand ourselves. We don't have support from others. Pride can also keep us from um, getting in touch with ourselves. And then here's a big one. We have fear of what we, could, what we might find. So if I just stay busy and get a lot of stuff done, people will praise me and not even question my spirituality because they'll assume that I have it all together. So sometimes fear is what is motivating us to um, stay very superficial in our relationship with the Lord. Let's see, the second uh, principle that uh, Crab brings to us is that it's God who reaches our hearts. He does the work. We cooperate by being real. So here's this idea that we're in relationship with God. And um, he's not just going to come swoop down on us and force us to become spiritually formed, but he will form us spiritually if we let him. So I think the point here is that God is the one who sanctifies us. It's his job to bring this about. And that, again, can, can disarm us of this kind of um, a frenetic approach to spirituality. What do I have to do? What's the list? Can I get it all together? What's the newest trend that's out there? I don't know if there's a newest trend. I I think he's got it covered, and um, he can help us. That's that's his vision for us, is to be united with him. And you know what? One day we are going to be united with him, which is amazing. And so if you think about your justification, what would you do to make yourself justified? What would you bring to him? Your sin? (laughs) Your, Your neediness? That's what you brought to him. What did you bring to him, or what will you bring to him to make yourself glorified? What are you going to do to make that happen? Let him do it? I mean, that's about all we have. I can't glorify myself. So why do all of a sudden, in the sanctification or spiritual formation, we think it's our job to make it happen? So all of a sudden, this takes the pressure off. Oh, this is God's work. This is the Spirit's work. It's a Spirit-driven process to form Christ in me. That's the good news as well. And so it takes the pressure off. Now, it doesn't mean I'm just passive and I put my Bible underneath my pillow at night and I hope that by osmosis I grow spiritually. I have a job to do. It's relationship. It is surrender to that, the Spirit's voice in my life. 
So um, the point here is that I need to abide in Christ. That's how I cooperate. I cooperate by being real with him. And again, that's my need for self-awareness because I realize so much of my life is not spent in abiding in Christ. I abide in a lot of other things, fear, worry, um, you know, status, all that sort of stuff. And so if I can learn to abide in Christ, I'm freed up now to just let him live his life through me. I'm not, I don't have an agenda. I think the um, New Testament is replete with examples of this cooperative work that it does take to be transformed. Um, I'm going to focus on Galatians 2.20, which is uh, Paul the Apostle's spiritual formation roadmap. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So we see this idea of my old life, my self-life, the things that used to rule me and motivate me are being crucified with Christ. Those things have to die. And that's the work that the Spirit will help us to surrender to him. And it's no longer I who um, generate my life. I abide in Christ and his life lives in me. Now this doesn't come naturally to us, does it? How do I do this? It's it's not a formula, right? And that frustrates us. But because this is what God wants to do in our lives, I think he will teach us. He will train us. And he gives us great examples and models and people that we get to rub shoulders with who are further along in the journey than we are. Another passage that comes to mind is one that was just preached on in my local church this last uh, Sunday was Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. It's kind of a longer passage, but we're going to focus on the putting off and the putting on. But the context here starts with 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. So that old way of life doesn't make sense based on ultimate reality, which is truth. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. And I think sometimes we look at the sensuality of our culture and the world around us and we're like, oh, you heathens. But it's connected to a false belief. And so until those false beliefs are changed, the gravitation towards these temptations is, is probably not going to change. We might be able to shame people into getting their act together, but their deep beliefs haven't been touched by the truth of who God is and that he's their ultimate delight. And I think that's what needs to take place as we disciple new believers who have been indulging in all kinds of sensuality in their lives and they don't realize that Christ is their ultimate delight and pleasure. And so that's going to take some time for their taste buds to start to recognize this is good, God is good, and we taste and see that the Lord is good. So there just needs to be an experiential reality of that. I will keep going with Ephesians now. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self. So you hear the work that we get to do? Put off the old self. Now, if I'm not in touch with the old self, I have a really hard time putting it off, don't I? I can say, oh, it's awful to do these sinful things, but if I don't see the motives and the deep beliefs that are generating some of that behavior that doesn't fit the Christian standard, then I, I don't really have access for God to change me from the inside out. So we are to put off the old self. So we might need to do some studying. What, what is the old self? What are the patterns of this world? That would be a good thing to start thinking about. What are the patterns of this world that have been enculturated into my heart, even if I was raised from a young child in a Christian home? 
There are still patterns that are embedded in me that are part of the old way of life, life apart from God. So he says to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And you think, oh, well, if you put it that way, Paul, yeah, you're right. I don't want to live a corrupted life. I want to live a full, abundant life. And that's what Jesus said he came to bring. I came to bring you life and that more abundantly. That's the promise of being a follower of Jesus. And so Paul is saying that your former manner of life is corrupt through deceitful desires. And then we are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Do you hear knowledge of God there? To be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And so now I need truth. I need the knowledge of God. I need the knowledge of my identity in Christ and live in a manner that's different than those who don't have Christ. I need the, that information to change my life. And then we put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. That's the vision that God has for you. The question is, do you want that vision? Do you want his life? Or do you kind of want to be able just to get to heaven and still live your life your way. Because I think a lot of times in our churches, we think we kind of want to get away with still living life our way, but what do we have to do to get into heaven? That's not the understanding of a biblical sense of spirituality. And I don't think that was the sense of brethren spirituality as well. And I'm very happy to be part of a tradition that really connected um, this understanding that spirituality was a way of life. You don't just make a one-time decision and get fire insurance. It's a life that we are bought and brought up into. So I think embedded in these verses are important truths about God's work. He's the one who created the new self and our work, putting off the old self and putting on the new self. And that's how we abide, abide in Christ. This requires double knowledge and cooperating with God by being honest about the old self that still has residence in our lives. And even as frustrating as it is to get in touch with that, it is part of the repentance cycle that we must find ourselves in um, on a daily basis. All right. Um, Progress in sanctification, this is a quote from G.C. Burkauer. Progress in sanctification never meant working out one's own salvation under one's own auspices. On the contrary, it meant working out one's own salvation with a rising sense of dependence on God's grace. And I think as we continue get, to get in touch with our inadequacies, our neediness, our sense of, wow, I'm not as righteous as I would like to be, doesn't that give you a rising sense of dependence on Christ's righteousness and his power to do something very real inside of me that I can't generate on my own? So no matter how hard I try to pull myself up by my bootstraps, it's still not enough. I need Christ. And so Christ is not a figure for coming uh, to a saving knowledge. He's an ongoing person that I turn to throughout the day, and that's relationship, that's intimacy, and that's a, a prayer life that is just kind of part of living and breathing and, and, and walking, that just, just kind of becomes part of who we are. The um, third principle that Crab brings to us is one of relational growth with God. One clear evidence, perhaps the strongest, that God is reaching our hearts or is forming us is our discovery of a desire within us that wants to experience God, or maybe you could say relate to Him, more than we want our lives to go well. Ooh. <laughs> what Crab means by this is that growth and spirituality must entail hating sin, all forms of it, even motives, attitudes, and value systems. So those are the things that are going on beneath the surface, not just our behaviors. And these are the things that are opposed to 
abiding in Christ or dependence on God. And so we hate um, our sin more than we hate our pain. And you kind of have to understand his background as a therapist because he had a lot of people coming to him as a counselor telling them all about the horrible things in their lives and the pain. And he realized that, well, we kind of focus on our pain more than we focus on the fact that our pain has generated a life apart from God. And from that, that's out of which I'm now responsible for my own sin, self-protection, ways that I move towards people to try to validate who I am, ways that I try to promote myself. And so um, recognizing that we kind of have this consumer mentality embedded in all of us, um, again, I think is going to be an important part of recognizing the old patterns of this life. The old life is that you are empty. But we were designed for relationship, right? And so without God in my life, without Christ at the center, then all I have is me, myself, and I to make this life work. And I will use everything and everybody around me to try to fill my life. And so as a Christian, that doesn't make sense anymore because now I have Christ at the center of my life. Yet, sometimes in our churches, sometimes in my own life, I still find myself operating with that old pattern of life. And so Christ wants to free us up from that. Oh, we're done. Okay. So um, that second phrase, he says, we'll be more concerned about getting God than we are about getting things from God. Our, um, the last one that he comes to us with, I think, is very convicting as well and um, will give us a lot to chew on. God's power is fully available to us to the degree that we fully pursue his purposes, not ours. And isn't it gracious of God to not enable us to keep living in the power of the self? He wants to live us, help us to live in the power of the spirit. And so sometimes he kind of thwarts us, doesn't he? Sometimes he doesn't always give us what we want because he wants to give us what we need. And so his power is fully available to us um, to the extent that we're pursuing his purposes. And his purposes for us are what we were actually designed for. There are two energies at work within us, and I think this is maybe where I will um, leave us to um, think about this a little bit. And um, that is the desire to use God to get what we want. So God's not going to give us the power to pursue that in our lives. And then there's the other energy that he wants to promote in us, the desire to be used by God to get what he wants. And I think these two energies can be a great way to think about knowledge of self. I can ponder that throughout my day. What energy was at work with me in that conversation? Was it the desire to use God to get what I want? Or was I moving towards that person with the desire for God to use me to get what he wants? Even if it meant that person doesn't think I'm very interesting or doesn't have high thoughts of me. Can I go away from that and let that be what God uses to get glory for himself? So I think those are some ways that we can start to get in touch with what's going on beneath the surface. And again, I don't think it means we need to spend hours and hours in silence and solitude. You'll see on the, um, some of the suggestions that I have are to spend some time in silence. But I don't think we have to spend hours and hours. I think some of these things are just um, growing mindfulness of what really is motivating me, what's going on beneath the surface. And then if I can get in touch with that, then I can ask the question, why? And that might mean God might have to reveal the why. Why am I motivated certain ways that um, are still part of the old life? And what can he do? What truth, what knowledge of God will help to release me from still operating in that old manner of life so that I can be operating 
in the new way of life, life that is now connected to Christ, lived out through his spirit in me.